You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 7, Sonnet 6 and the Dedication. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and more importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. Please keep your suggestions and criticism coming. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 6. Then let not winter's ragged hand deface In thee thy summer, ere thou be distilled. Make sweet some vial, treasure thou some place, with beauty's treasure, ere it be self-killed. This first quatrain continues the distillation image from the previous sonnet. In those days, ragged meant rough, shaggy, and bristly, which suggests old and wrinkly. And treasure is the treasure mentioned in sonnet two, a storehouse of valuable objects, which in this case means Shakespeare's beautiful ideas and the displaced love for his lost son. The vial is the sonnet, and its treasured place is the sonnet sequence. That use is not forbidden usury, which happies those that pay the willing loan. The usury and willing loan established in Sonnet 4 refer to the act of investing Shakespeare's legacy in the sonnets. Willing here, as in most if not all of its uses throughout the sequence, is a pun on Shakespeare's name, so the willing loan is a loan of will himself. That's for thyself to breed another thee, or ten times happier be it ten for one. Ten times thyself were happier than thou art, if ten of thine ten times refigured thee. Each sonnet is a little son, a little replacement for Hamlet, who was in turn a little version or replacement of Shakespeare. From the farming reference in Sonnet 1, Shakespeare is breeding sonnets, and each sonnet's maturation will make Shakespeare happy for having invested in it. If one sonnet can make Shakespeare happy, and if an additional sonnet can make the first sonnet happy, then ten will make them ten times happier. If ten sonnets will make them ten times happier, then a hundred sonnets will do something magical. The word refigure is critical here, because with a hundred sonnets, Shakespeare will have enough parts of himself embedded to be recognizably refigured, reconstructed, resurrected. Then what could death do if thou shouldst depart? leaving thee living in posterity. To depart here clearly means to die, with Shakespeare's death being his departure from the physical plane and his leaving the sonnets behind. But there's another sense attached. By being published, the sonnet sequence is being sent on a journey into the future, into eternity, into the reader's hands wherever and whenever they might be. This couplet's use of the second person is particularly interesting. You are departing, leaving you living in posterity. On the one side of the looking glass, Shakespeare is leaving the sonnets and leaving his reflection living on in them. On the other, the sonnets are leaving Shakespeare by being published and will live on for future generations. Be not self-willed, for thou art much too fair, to be death's conquest, and make worms thine heir. Recalling self-killed from line four, self-willed has a similar meaning. If Shakespeare keeps his words to himself, it is a form of suicide. If he dies without publishing the sonnet, it will be a final death, and the readers won't be able to resurrect him. The word art here works just like it did in Sonnet 1. Thou that art now. Not only is Shakespeare too beautiful for death, but so is his art, the sonnets. What these final lines are saying is that by being selfless and by lending his spirit to the sonnets, and therefore to the reader, Shakespeare will be protected from death, and the worms will not be the only heirs to his legacy. Right, let's analyze the dedication. Having seen the sonnets depart in the previous lines, we are now in a far better position to discuss the dedication pages of the sonnets, which have baffled scholars and fans for centuries. These are two pages at the beginning of the 1609 quarto edition of the sonnets, the title page and the dedication. The title page says, Shakespeare's Sonnets, never before imprinted. Never before imprinted is important because some of Shakespeare's sonnets were circulated against his wishes, and this line informs us that this is the definitive edition. 
The dedication is as follows. To the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, Mr. W. H., all happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet, wisheth the well-wishing adventurer in setting forth, T.T. It is my opinion that Shakespeare and the printer, Thomas Thorpe, worked very closely together to ensure that there were no errors or misprints in the sonnet sequence, and that Thomas Thorpe would have been the one and only person we can be sure would know what the sequence was about. The only begetter of these sonnets is Mr. W. H., which is either William himself or a conflation of the names William and Hamlet, the father and son reflections that have inspired and created the sequence in its entirety. All happiness is the happiness described in Sonnet 6, which we've just read through, and the eternity promised by the ever-living poet is the journey into posterity that Shakespeare has promised himself, the poet who will live forever buried in the sonnets, his last will and testament. The well-wishing adventurer is both Shakespeare's sonnets and the reader. Not only is Thorpe wishing the publication well, but he is referring to the well in which Narcissus sees his reflection, making Shakespeare's reflection the adventurer wishing in the well, as well as the reader looking at his reflection looking back at them. This is borne out in the experience described by the attached poem, A Lover's Complaint. Setting forth is a pun, referring to the setting of the type in the printing press, the sonnets departing on their journey into the darkness of the unknown future, and the reader departing on their journey into the beautiful, dark depths of Shakespeare's consciousness. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking and please join our community discussions on reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an x. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another enough. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? surrender.